Okay, so I am back, and um, you know, I decided I would log back on again, you guys. But uh, of course, I am not. The equipment is behind me right now. The studio equipment. Um, Let's see who's hanging out on the Saturday since everybody wants me to get on and uh and chat. I want to talk about this this record that uh that I just did on D shot and Keek the Sneak. Once again, I'm testing my live again because this will be the second time I've done it. So I'm just kind of testing to see uh my audio. Just today I hooked my audio up, so I'm testing my audio and uh, seeing how all that is working, you guys. Let's see, uh, give me one second. Just a little bit. Let's see, eh, that might be too high. That's cool. Back to normal. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, where are we at, you guys? Give me one second. Uh, let's see. So I'm testing my audio second second day in a row uh, with with my live audio, I'm just testing. So as I continue to go live, I can work out the bugs and stuff and figure out what works and what doesn't. Uh, let's see, um, something else I'm trying to do right now. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Hold on. Okay, so anyway, I'm sitting here messing around. Excuse me if I, if things look weird for me because uh, uh, I am just figuring this little live thing out. Uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> this is kind of funny, you guys. Um, okay, so there we go. Okay. So it's me. I'm just messing around, you guys. Messing around. I had such a cool response last night with you guys jumping on. Uh, I am not in the studio. I am in the studio, but I'm not behind the equipment. I'm sitting back here against the wall. And um, I could have, honestly, turned on the equipment, but I said maybe I'm not going to do that today. I just wanted to chat a little bit about the state of R&B and uh, where R&B music is right now. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Okay, this is kind of neat. This is this is pretty cool, you guys. Uh, okay, I'm just messing around. So I'm figuring this all this whole thing out. It's it's ra it's rather cool to be able to figure it out. And is my camera crooked? Doesn't look crooked. Here it looks crooked, but here it doesn't look crooked. Um, okay, so anyway, you guys, I am. I wanted to get on here and talk about the state of r and I was uh, thinking about, you know, all the things that Tyrese was talking about, and I thought it was interesting to, um, to, to, to see Tyrese and his conversations about r and I mean, I've always felt that way. Anybody that knows me in the music industry knows that one thing I always talk about is the state of R&B and where R&B music is. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> hmm. The state, sorry. The state of R&B and where R&B music is right now, where it is in people's minds and people's spirits, R&B is still one of the most beloved genres of music. 
And, um, and no matter what you say or do, the music will continue to go down in history as we continue to get older. Whatever we listen to that we consider ratchet music as, an, as an, a person in their 40s or 50s, you start to kind of taper off those things that you listen to. And you start to be more conscious about the, the things that you pay attention to and you listen to, right? Um, I, you know, I wanted to get into the minds of what people thought about R&B these days because we have the mumble, I call it mumble R&B. We got the mumble rap. But the fundamentals of R&B and getting back to, and this is probably something I probably should have put on the Stone Packs and Music and Life podcast, but hell, this is my podcast too. I'm sitting on this couch instead of the couch in the other spot, right? The white couch. I'm sitting here in the studio and I will probably make this part of the Stone Packs and Music and Life podcast as well. But um, my thing is, okay, so, you know, everybody's yelling the last two years, hip hop, uh, probably the last two and a half, three years, the charts have not been dominated by rap and hip hop, which is interesting. There hasn't been a number one rap or hip hop album. or Well, recently Eminem had that one. But for two years straight, the charts were not dominated by hip hop as far as number one positions, which is interesting because for the longest it was. Is it is it is it that people are getting tired of you know uh, hip hop? Uh, what's up? What's up, Cortez? What's happening, family? All oh, the volumes are okay. Thank you, Cortez. Let me bring it up. Okay, what about now? How's the volume sound? Is it good? Am I good now? Am I cool? Okay, much better. Okay, yeah, I had to turn it up over there. So, and Cortez, thanks for tuning in, family. I appreciate it. Um, you know, yesterday I got on the live. Today, everybody, um, I mean, I got on the live yesterday, and, you know, people liked it, so... I typically do my podcast with, I usually pre-tape it and then I post it, you know what I mean? So everybody got on yesterday and it kind of blew my mind. People tuned in and I was like, so I asked people, do should I do more lives? And everybody was like, yeah, man, do more lives. So here I am doing more lives. I'm behind the studio. So of course my equipment is over that way. I am going to go probably, you know, um, I don't know if I'm going to go live again later in the studio because I'm going to do a... Um, a breakdown of the track I did on D Shot, the legendary D Shot featuring Keek the Sneak, written by D Shot himself and myself. I co wrote, I did the chorus. I have myself, Alan McNeil, uh, singing on the chorus as well as me producing it. And it's a remake of Bobby Womack's, um, uh, what song is that? Du -du 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 Wait until tonight. So I turned that into a hip hop version. But okay, so we're going to get to that one. But let me get back to this. So, um, the state of R&B, okay, thank you, Brother Cortez, thank you, I appreciate that. So, you know, so the last two years with, with hip-hop being dominant over the charts, we have not seen um, hip-hop in the last two years, excuse me, was not as dominant as, as it typically was. So like, number one records were hip-hop. Probably the top two and three records used to be hip-hop records, right? But the last two years, you haven't seen that. And then Eminem, of course, with this new album, it was number one. It was number one for a while. I don't know. I think it's still up there. But we're talking about R&B and the state of R&B. And what's the passion of R&B? Are people really still deeply connected to R&B? I'm an R&B artist, so these are the conversations that I always have with people. Um, I love the fact that Tyrese is very passionate about speaking about R&B because we have to keep R&B music is connected to African American people's African American people's history and their legacy as a culture. Okay, just like Latinas, um, uh, merengue, salsa, cumbia, uh, and 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 other forms of music. Africans from Africa, with their their um, uh, different styles of music that are connected to their culture. They don't. They might listen to other styles of music, but they support and continue to support their culture when it comes to music. You understand what I'm saying? Um, what's up? What's up? The Beat beat Buffet, what's happening? Thank you for tuning in, family. I appreciate you for stopping in. 
having a conversation about uh, R&B, the state of R&B, and what we can do as consumers and lovers of R&B to keep the legacy of that alive because it's, ta it's, atta it's attached to. This is the thing about live. When you do live, you're going to stumble bumble. But <laughs> look, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, I think old Cortez says, I think older artists. Hold on, let me hit that, make that bigger so I can see that. He said, I think older artists, to be honest, are people our age, are people my age don't take music as seriously. For them, it's more about getting attention. You know what, bro? Like, real talk, man. Like, it's crazy you say that because this is a conversation I say to younger artists that are rappers or singers. I say, listen, man, you're going to be older than you are younger. And they're like, huh? And I'm like, think about it. You're going to be older than you are younger. You don't, you're not going to be young forever. So you're going to end up liking old school music anyway. It doesn't matter. Your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend is going to introduce you to it, your partner. You're going to go to a party. They're going to be playing some old school music. And then you're going to be like, oh, I like old school music. You might not be paying attention to it now. You might not pay attention to R&B now. But I promise you, during the period of your life, you will tune into R&B sooner or later, and you're going to be like, oh, shit, I love it. Cleveland Flipper, my, my people from Cleveland. What's happening, family? Uh, the TV show comes, it airs on the 17th, the 17th. And I think, you know, I really think they're going to air our ep episode first. They're going to air the episode that I'm in first, according to what I heard. But I know uh, they shoot those season three shoots off, takes off on the 17th. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's going to be interesting. It's going to be int interesting, fam. It's like, uh, yeah, man, I, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm going to watch it the first day. I'm probably not going to watch it. I'm going to be like this. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah. So, Brother Cortez, listen. Um, Cortez says people still play music. From the 70s and uh, exactly exactly see that's my point and this is what i this is what i tell people man like when you're doing the backyard barbecues and you're chilling and you're hanging out with family man you ain't trying to hear a whole bunch of rah rah you know you're gonna you'll play your hip-hop you feel what i'm saying you're gonna play some of your hip-hop because because you love your hip-hop right but you're not gonna be playing no none of that crazy stuff you're gonna play that traditional hip-hop you feel me you're not gonna play none of the the crazy shoot them up, bang, bang, whatever, whatever, right? Um, uh, let me watch my words, because I know YouTube be bleep, you know, they be doing stuff. So you're not going to be doing the rah-rah stuff, right? So, um, yes, you go to the parties, they playing 70s, 80s, everybody's grooving, and, and you're like, man, I ain't never even heard that record. So if you, if you were never into old school r and I promise you eventually you will be. We're going to be older than we are younger. So why not African-Americans support you why not support our music of our culture why not support the music that has been the soundtrack to black people's lives why not what's the problem why, why don't why can't we do that you feel what i'm saying because i'll tell you something deep i was i was part of i was the vice president for this tour it was called the omg funk festival right so we had like 15 almost 20 dates across the country. It was, it was myself. I, was, I made myself an opening act. Then I still had to perform again because I was with the Rick James Stone City Band. So I put them on the tour. I put Lakeside on the tour, Yarbros and People, Steve Arrington. Ah, um, oh man. It's so many other groups. I can't even remember. It was so many. And it was called the OMG Funk Festival. Now, you'll be surprised if I tell you that that whole tour was supported by Hispanics. Hispanics coming out, watching the show. Latinas coming out, buying the tickets. I used to sit back in the audience, and I can actually post a video and show you. I'm not even making this up. I have a video, 10,000, 8 to 10,000 people packed, sold out venue. And I'm looking out. I'm looking out there trying to see how many black folks. No joke. I remember walking. We were walking through. I got a video of us walking through the crowd to the stage because for some reason 
the tour buses were blocking the back of the stage, and we, for some reason we couldn't get back there. So the whole band, Stone City Band, all of us, I got a video of us, I, I don't know, I turned on my camera, I got a video of us walking down the concert hall stage, the outside venue, and we're walking down, and I'm looking around, and I'm looking for black folks. Bro, I'm not even making this up. I, I think the most black people that was on that show were the ones on the stage. We have become, African Americans have become detached to what has, because see, we feel like we can just go recreate something new. We feel like, ah, shit, we'll just go re recreate some new R&B, some new hip hop. And that's where the hip hop and R&B came from because we, we got away from the element of what we do and we figure, oh, uh, we'll just go create a new sound, right? Yep. Cortez said, yep, I noticed even in the comment section of older music, there's other groups supporting our music. Meanwhile, we are listening to the, the dumbed down modern music. Bro, listen, it is, it is such a virus that's going on in the African-American community that we, we really have to look deep inside of, of what that's about and figure out what we can do to solution that. Right. I tell everybody, I said, OK, it's OK if there's a problem. But what's the solution to the problem? What is the solution? What are we willing to do to, to solve this problem that we have? And that is how do we get our people? And don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong, because I don't want everybody to think I'm sitting here beating up on our community. I'm not. I'm saying some real stuff, man. How do we get our people back involved? Like you got what's so cool about it, though, you got the younger generation knowing about Frankie Beverly because you know why the aunts and uncles are still going to the concert and they're bringing the kids. I love that. They're bringing the younger kids. So now Frankie Beverly is being introduced. But another good part is I see little kids who nobody might never tell them about Michael Jackson. And you look up and these little kids are on YouTube watching Michael Jackson and the parents never told them about, about uh, anything about Michael. But that's only that's that's a small percentage of what we need to do. We need to keep that culture of music alive and R&B is the fundamental of it. I mean, African Americans created jazz, R&B, rock, and every sector of music that we created has been taken from us. It's always taken from us and it's taken from other groups of people who take it and run with it and do whatever they want with it. And then we look up and we, we're complaining about they're taking our music, but we don't support our music. So what do you expect's gonna happen when nobody is supporting what they say is theirs or what they say they have created. We don't care about it. So you don't think other cultures are looking at it going, well, shoot, they don't care about their music. We're going to take it and flip it and call it, you know, uh, pop R&B. We're going to take it and flip it and make it like it's ours, you know. And so you've seen the R&B charts dominated by white artists the last century or so. Well, last, excuse me, last 10 years, 20 years, I'm going to be honest with you has been dominated by white people, non-African-Americans. You Give me the last R&B artist that has sold 30 million records. I mean, I can name some, but let, let's just say, like, right out the gate, 30 million records the first week or two, and it's still in, in the top two. I mean, we got Chris Brown, but I'm talking about the last 10 years straight. Not Sam Smith. I mean, we can, Adele and all them, they call them R&B. So those are the artists that have dominated mostly the radio charts and the charts. And we still have the urban charts, which is mostly African-American based, the urban radio charts. And the, oh, we know every town's got the black stations that play all the black artists. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the crossover mainstream radio artists that are doing R&B. Are the Sam Smiths, the, uh, you know, um, the, the uh, uh, I just named the, uh, the young lady a minute ago that are charting the charts, that are holding Justin Timberlake, R&B, but you're not seeing any African-American artists dominating those level of sales or even awareness because black people might top off at three million, maybe six million in sales. And uh, you have somebody exception with somebody like Chris Brown and Usher, but that's longevity. They've been doing it so long, they got a fan base and it continues to grow. But as a whole, as a community, our music is not and has not been working for us in our favor because we feel like it's expendable. We can just throw it away and start over again. 
What's up, Brother Gary? What's happening with you, family? Thank you. Thank you for checking in, fam. Hey, make sure you guys hit like, fam. I'm, I'm not seeing, I don't see no likes on them, man. Y'all got to help a brother out on them likes, man. Thank, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Hit, hit me up on them likes, too. So, um, yeah, so how do we get back to that? And I know I've dedicated my life to R&B and the passion and the love of R&B. Uh, Gary Smith, look, look at Gary. Gary Smith says, look at most of the sample packs, companies and young producers who are doing. Who are doing how to's for hip hop drills are white, bro. Oh, my God. Why? Hey, why, hey, listen, Gary, why did I wake up this morning, open up my computer and that's the first shiznick that I saw? Hit those likes up for me, you guys. Hit, hit those likes up for me. Why was that the first shiznick I saw? Like, honestly, I was like, yo, why is it every time I turn on YouTube, there's some some white dude, and I ain't hating on my white brothers, you know what I'm saying? It's all love. But what happened to African-American people being so passionate about their music? Anything music, even h historical values of hip-hop and what Kanye's done or what African Bambada's done, you, it's a white cat who's, who's actually doing the YouTube videos on it and they diving deep and they know the history. And I, I love that, but it's such shame that we don't, we don't take our culture as serious until we see somebody wearing the braids or doing our music. Then we want to be mad and talk about it, but we're not even supporting each other. None of us are supporting each other, but we, we, we want to talk about African-Americans. I mean, white folks or other races, or Hispanics that are taking our music and doing things with it, right? And not paying respects. Brother Cortez said there's literally, okay, Brother Cortez says, yes, even people showing tutorials of older music are white. I noticed absolutely. And he says, there's literally a handful of black people I see doing a lot of tutorials. That's what Brother Cortez said. And then Brother Gary said, we need to tell our story. Come on, man. Thank, listen, thank you guys, man. And that's all I'm saying. It's not me beating up on any other race. I'm not here to beat up on anybody. I'm just here to, to be responsible, to do my part as a artist, as somebody in the music industry that's respected by heavyweight names, as a person that people call on me and ask my advice. What am I here for? What's my real purpose? Why am I gonna sit here on this earth and not make some sort of difference when I have a voice and I'm just going to sit here and just be like mute and not say shit. Right. Uh, the beat buffet says, he said, I think we, we got away from the church too. That is where it's rooted. That's where a lot of good musicians are from. Absolutely. Facts. Cause you know, I grew up in church. You're right. That was a meeting hub. That was a conversation piece for the men and for the women. We got away from that. And that is the fundamental start of that relationship, the support with each other that then goes outside of the church and sector sectors into other things that are obvious, like what I'm saying, right? Uh, William Johnson, what's up, brother? Thank you, family. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, brother. He says, I love your videos, brother, and the knowledge you drop. Brother William, I, I thank you for tuning in. Please hit like. So we can uh, and make sure you hit that bell notification. So you guys, as soon as I go on, you'll get my notifications. Let's hit like, man, so we can get this trending so we can get more people involved in this conversation. We have gotten away from the obvious, and that is our relationship with our community. And that that operates in so many other ways. That's not just hey, that's not even just music. I mean, we really can go deep with this. Right. Brother Cortez says uh, best buffet. Good. Good point. And most of, uh, well, why is this little heart in my way? Say most of the, well, what this little heart thing is in my way. I can't even read the rest of your comment. Most of this got to start planning. Okay. Most of these, I could, I can't see the other part of what you're saying. Cause this little heart thing is in a way, my apologies, but I was trying to read your comment. Um, brother Cortez. So yes, the church was a hub for all things cultural wise right we got away from that yeah all the greats ab absolutely all the greats brother cortez started in the church 
uh, the Beat Buffet said, the respect and love for each other now, a lot of music is hating against each other. You know, man, and how do we, and honestly, like, we, it, it, like one person can't solve this alone, but I do have a solution in my head, right? My thoughts are, think of the power of music. The same music that's causing these young dudes to go and hurt each other, right? And, and, and you know, uh, unlife each other. I, I, I have to watch these words. Think about where the seed started. The seed started in the music. That seed started in the music, you guys. In the music. So if you think about it, it's, it's, a, it's a dark seed that's being planted in the music lyrically. That's why when I write records, I watch what I say. I don't even I don't even play with it, bro. Like when I write records, I'm I'm careful. I'm actually scared when I write records because I know the responsibility of the pen, right? Um so I'm careful. And I'll reanalyze lyrics. I'll write something and look at it and be like, oh no, change it, erase that. Because I understand the power of those words. I think the responsibility of an artist is the carefulness of what we are projecting out there because it started with the messages in the music which caused people to do. There's no more love in music anymore. Do you remember the days when when we were little? Uh, if you're in your 50s or your 40s, it doesn't even matter. Do you, well, especially 50s and 40s because back in the day there were songs that they were writing and we didn't even know they were talking about anything derogatory until we got older and we're like, oh, smack. Is that what they were really saying? We're like, oh my God, I never even knew that. But you know, as kids, our parents will let us listen to it and we just singing along the words and you get older and find out what they were really talking about, right? The imagination is gone. That's the reason I write the records I write and I write the way I write. Uh, the Beat Buffet, say, Buffet says, music touches the soul like no other art form. Absolutely. And it's the most powerful element next to politics and religion. And this is why we have to figure out, like us, all of us musicians that are on this live and producers, what's our responsibility and our expectation from the universe and from God is to make sure that while we are here, that we do something to give back, something to give back to the community of music that's going to help it in a surreal way and spiritual way to where when you're gone, that seed will live on and that message that you've shared has lived on. And it starts with, in our lyrics. It's in our lyrics. It's, it's, it's simple mathematics. It is truly in our lyrics. If you say something to somebody negative over and over and over again, over and over again, right? The same message, right? You can tell a person you're, you're, you're stupid, right? You can say that over and over and over again. And we know growing up as kids, how many times have we heard our aunts and uncles stop being so dumb? Right? And you say it over and over again. And eventually we grow up and we start believing some of the narrative of some of those things. Big Meech. Hey, you guys, Big Meech in the house, you guys. Hello, Patricia. Hi, Patricia. My brother, Big Meech, legendary Big Meech, rapper extraordinary. Big Meech say, give it time. And it'll return full circle uh, like bell bottoms. And it won't be our people, our culture. It's most hated, but the most influential in music, sports. We're the most influential in music and sports, et cetera. Big Meech, thank you, brother, for that comment. I appreciate you for, for taking your time because I know how busy you are with studying and stuff and being involved in the church. And this, this brother right here is a prime example of what I'm saying. He's always been a very amazing brother and we've done music together and he's he's had records out back when biggie had his albums out big meach had records out that were doing very well on the charts he was signed i think it was scotty brother records when that album we we were promoting back in the day came out meach right was that scotty brothers back in the day but big meach has been in this business for years i'm trying to get him to do we've done some records but i'm trying to get him to do a full album He's focused on the gospel sector, really passing a great message now. So hopefully him and I can get back in the studio and finish that record, uh, Demetrius. Um, Brother Gary said, our ancestors used to perform music not only to heal spiritually, also physically. Yes. You know what? Here's the crazy part about that. Now, me growing up and going to school for music, one thing I learned in music, I used to always tell my music teacher, my band teacher, I used to ask him weird questions about, like, 
the key of G or A or B. And I notice certain keys are healing keys, right? Healing frequencies, right? Like, you know, key of A or G or whatever. Certain ones are better for healing. So I notice when I write my records, I write my records in a certain key. But I notice the key, you know, you write records, you can write records in keys that will actually move a person's spirit. This is why the negative the negative powers that be, I'm not going to say any names, these negative powers that be that run the world are now tapping into using frequency to alter people's minds. So that frequency based on that key, 440, 440 hertz, um, you know, we, we tune our guitar in 440, right? But then there's some other ones that can really get a person's mind going. So if you notice, if you pay attention to your TV, you could be in your living room. And I'm about to tell you something to blow your mind. You can be in your living room, and then all of a sudden, you hear a, your commercial comes on, and you hear a ding, ding, and you look around, you, you go check your front door, and you're like, somebody ring the doorbell? No, they're, they're throwing a frequency out there to, to subliminally train you to paying attention to the TV. But also, it's into altering other things. So this whole thing with music has gotten so deep, it, once again, it's equivalent to politics, okay? Only thing with music, you can't, all you can do is try to influence the person that does it to, to be in power and work in your favor. That's all you can do, right? Or you can actually build something that alters people's minds through frequency. And this is a fact, you guys. So this thus politicians using artists to try to be part of whatever agenda they have, right? Because they understand that these artists are dealing with frequencies through their writing and they know they can tap into their people and utilize that element. Once again, music is as powerful as politics and religion. Only thing with music, we don't, we don't necessarily argue. People argue politics and religion. Two other things they don't argue is music and spirituality. You'll never hear people arguing music. You might argue who your favorite artist is, but you're, you're really not going to argue. Like musicians, we argue what songs we don't like. Or oh, that beat's not tight. But we don't really argue. We kind of just like, well, I like it this way. But it's not like, so make it or break it. Like, well, I don't like it. Because as soon as a person leaves, we'll put a record on the play and be like, you'll find something in that record you like. So it's never a make it or break it when it comes to music. But when we're dealing with other elements people like to fight about, which is politics and religion. And this is why music is so powerful, because subliminally you can utilize it to move things without even realizing it's being moved. And people don't realize they're being moved. So in the African-American community, us getting back, to the ownership of what we have created is going to come with a lot of passion of knowing how important it is for the legacy of our kids in the future and those kids and, and, and those kids. And how do we continue that legacy if we don't teach the ones now the importance of, of raw R&B? I love when Tyree said, Miss Patricia said, Patricia said, I was telling artists a long time ago, the music, that music was changing. I told them their words have power. Amen. Amen. The buffet, uh, the beat buffet said four, four, three, two hertz. Uh-huh. Equals love. You're something like that. Yeah, it does. Okay, so my music, I'm always writing in that frequency, right? And so people are like, dude, why? You know, people listen to my music and sometimes they're like, man, I like that. And sometimes you don't even know why you like an artist's music, but there's a reason. Smart artists and musicians will design their music to hit to hit your spirit automatically with those frequencies. 432 hertz. There's also some other other ones. 440. There's some other ones. I mean, you know, yeah, it's real. But if you don't know that, and if you don't see the importance of why music should stay connected with someone's culture then it's easy for that music to be given away and people will continue to complain why the music was taken away and you have black people saying, oh, they trying to take our music and, and I hear people complaining and I just kind of listen to them sometime and I'm like, well, yeah, they're going to take the music because you're not supporting it. Like, do you have my album? Well, no, I didn't know you had one. Out. That, that's my point. We're not even supporting our own people. So how do we expect somebody else to support it? No, they're going to come in and take it and do what they've been doing. I mean, this is nothing new. They've been doing this since the beginning of time, and they're not going to stop. The only thing African-Americans need to understand is the importance that our music plays in our culture, in our life, in our history of our forefathers, and beyond that, from Africa all the way here, from the rhythms being 
played, uh, uh, you know, to 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 allow us to know what tribes that we're a part of or to signal to us that there's something about to go on from the migration of that to America to the migration of that within the communities and the boroughs and the subcategories of, of communities all across the world. We have one thing in common, African Americans, and that is our music. Even if we don't ever agree, the one thing we all have in common with each other is the fact that our music connects us. But if we don't see how important that is, we will always be continue to be disconnected. And I believe if we can get connected with the music, it will allow us to be connected as a people again. Miss Patricia said, uh, it's the beat and the instrumentals that brings the lyrics to my songs. Yeah, so you so Miss Patricia, you like the music first, right? And then then you pay attention to the lyrics after that, huh? So the melody and the music catches you. Some people are different. Some people will listen to the lyrics, but actually most people tap into the beats first and then they pay attention to the lyrics and stuff. So so it's important to have a great rhythm. Brother Gary Smith said uh, each chakra has a frequency that aligns with the seventh notes in the, in the scale. Now, this is something that I know a lot about. Number one, I'm a musician. Number two, I'm a Buddhist. I agree with you, Brother Gary. Um, I meditate six or seven times a day. And, you know, the chakras start. That's why I tell people never vib vibrate from a low chakra. You vibrate from a low chakra. That's, that's dark energy. That's bad energy. From here to here, it doesn't go below the belly. And so I tell people, if you really get deep into the understanding of the pineal gland and chakras, you can really do some magical stuff. Undefeated is what I'm talking about. When I say, when I say this word, undefeated, Brother Sean, Hey, what's happening, family? Hey, Brother Sean, love family. Appreciate you logging in. Um, make sure you guys check out his, he's got a podcast on Instagram too that he's about to launch. Um, Sean D, that's, 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 that's my friend right there. Good brother right there. Um, listen, so you got to be responsible, but when you understand that this thing is so much bigger undefeated you start to realize right because let me tell you something i was just going through man i was going through this crazy crazy court case right i'm not going to talk about what it was about but let's just say it was about music and it was i was dealing with some of my people and um the beep up they say back in the old school days it was illegal to play certain intervals because of the catholic church it was demonic oh man bro listen man we're gonna have some deep we're gonna have some fun with this in the future ones because you're tapping into all these things that i i i sit and have conversations with people right here in my studio right here with these crystals behind me and the crystals in the other room and we end up having these crazy deep 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 deep, deep very important conversations that well needed conversations that and, and, you know, here's another thing. Black people got out of doing exactly what? Let me see if any of you guys know. What, if, what has black people gotten out of doing? There's one thing in the black community that all black folks have gotten out of doing. And let me see if anybody says it in the bottom. Don't think too hard. It's, it's simple that we've gotten out of doing right now. We've all gotten out of touch. We're doing it. Let's see. Brother Cortez says playing instruments. Okay, that's that's one point. That's one. That that's actually a vital important part. We have that we have for sure. But it's another very important one that's higher on the t top tier level. But it's so simple, and you and you guys are gonna agree with me. But instruments is up there. Instruments is within that category too, because when we were playing instruments, it it did create a sense of community with us because we would see people in the neighborhood rehearsing in the garage. I know I grew up rehearsing in the garage and there were four other dudes on the street and they'd be rehearsing or, or in the basements. And that was just a normal thing growing up. Everybody had a band. You know what I mean? It was normal. Okay. So nobody praying. That's another one praying. You know what? Let's put praying at the top of the list. Absolutely. Praying. And the most important thing that we've gotten out of doing I'm surprised Big Meech, Demetrius hadn't uh, chimed in on this one. You beat Demetrius to praying because usually he would have hit that up, but you hit it, uh, the beat buffet. Listen, we've gotten out of doing one thing. 
And that's exactly what you see me doing. Do you remember, do you guys remember the time you would, on the weekends, black people would get together for fish fries and they would talk and they'd sit around, have conversations, and the kids, you'd be in the other room or you'd have your own little table and all the adults would come together and they would talk and they'd play cards and discuss things that were going on in the community and in the world. This was a common practice in the black community. And guess what? I mean, I see cats playing spades, but I don't see cats having deep conversations. I still see that sometimes. I don't see the women adjourning like they used to. I don't see the aunties adjourning like they used to, the grandmothers. Right now, the grandmothers be up in the club trying to get their twerk on, man. Ain't nobody really trying to, you know, they barely trying to raise grandkids. We've gotten out of the community of this, the conversations. These sort of talks is what made the African-American community so powerful. White people still do it. Latinas still do. I see Latinas gathered at the store. Sometimes I'll go into a store, I'll see four or five Latina people, they standing there and they're talking, deep conversations. They're having deep conversations, right? I see white people adjourning, sitting having coffee, deep conversations. Tell me the last time you saw four black people sitting at Starbucks talking. Fellowship. Amen, brother. Fellowship. Tell me the last time you guys have seen four African-Americans sitting at Starbucks having a deep conversation and not drinking anything or not a barbecue. Like, let's don't worry about the barbecue. We, we do that well. Right. But outside of the barbecue, outside of the church, when was the last time you seen four or five African-Americans sitting, having great conversation? Okay, Brother Sean says some families don't don't sit for dinner. Uh, he says some families don't sit for dinner table and talk amongst each other. And yeah, unfortunately, Brother Sean, you're right. And then Brother Cortez says, not four laughing out loud. He says sometimes two or three at the most, and that's probably a couple. And Brother Cortez says, in my city, I see Latinos doing it every Saturday. Okay. So you remember what I said earlier, that back in the day, black people every weekend, you knew your aunt and your uncle and family members were coming over and their friends and the kids would be noisy in the house and everybody's talking. There's conversation. The parents say, go back there with them kids. You don't, uh, the adults is up here. You don't come over here. Stay your butt back there. Y'all remember that? Brother Cortez says, we don't do, do it as much. I think it's because parents are younger now and don't hold uh, tradition as much. That's what Brother Cortez said. Uh, the beep of face said, front row, you are absolutely right. Listen, the fact is, is we don't do it at all. I, I'm, a, I'm a numbers guy. So one thing about me, I'll, I'll do things based on numbers because I watch or I ask, I'll call my friends, say, when's the last time you, you know, your family got together? They'll be like, why are you asking me that? I'm, I'm just asking you, your family ever, because I like doing my little case studies. Probably more than 60 of my friends that are, I've asked over a period of time. They're like, man, I don't know the last time. I can't remember the last time when my family, when we got together, or anybody came by or even had a fish fry on a weekend. Years ago, most of them say. I do believe, yes, the grandmothers are younger. The grandmothers are now in their 40s and late 30s and 40s, maybe 50. They up in the clubs trying to twerk. Ain't nobody trying to teach these kids nothing. Uh, Brother Keith. Harrison, how you doing? Brother Key said, agree, we need to get back to fully supporting one another fully, not just music and life. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, I don't quite know what that means, but because uh, music and life is everything. You take away music, you take away life. You don't have life. You can't have life without music. Music is a fundamental soundtrack to everything we do. So imagine taking music away. There essentially isn't life because some people would actually probably go and unlife themselves. But your point is right when you say that we need to get back to supporting each other fully. But the whole music and life thing, I don't get that. You got to go a little bit deeper. It's, it's, it kind of you need to expand on that one. Expand on that one, Brother Keith, because you lost me on that one. Not just music and life. Yeah, expand whenever you feel like it. But. It has to get back to the fundamentals of community. Community, as simple as that. Talking to each other. 
uh, spending time sharing the things that's going on in the community, sharing what's happening, because it all spills over into what I'm saying when I say artists and creating music. When the foundation is built correct, then everything else falls in place. When the foundation that it's built on is solid, everything else falls in place like it should. The artists write better. The subject matters are better because they're held to a high level of responsibility by their elders through conversation. And by the way, my channel is called Music and Life, so dig that. So <laughs> we can go deep into that. Um, so it starts with that. If you think about it, if that foundation with the community and the conversation is there and that young person can now, whatever they want to do, I don't care if it's an attorney or whatever, the fundamentals of the knowledge and the support and the things that they are taught, the morality is there. And they're able to take that and run with that and turn that into something great. But if that something is not there from the start, then it, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter what you do. It doesn't matter what happens because that person is doomed, that young person is doomed to continue to go on in the future and do absolutely nothing. Uh, the Beat Buffet said, Quincy Jones said, there wouldn't be life without music. You have to have music to have life. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, Beat Buffet, thank you. Uh, so, Brother Keith, I hope you saw that and read that because you say not just in music, in life. No, it's in everything, brother. It's in music and life. It's, it's everything. Those two things are attached together. I told somebody one day, I said, I might do a documentary one day. And maybe I shouldn't say it because I don't want nobody on here trying to bite, take, try to bite something from me. <laughs> yeah. I'm just joking. I'm going to say it anyway. Because guess what? At least you could say I was the first person to say it, right? So here's my thoughts, you guys. And you tell me what you think about it. I thought about what if there was a documentary and I have all these great ideas I've done. I, I have all these great ideas I put down and I always end up making it happen. Uh, oh, Brother Keith said, never said wasn't in much. I said, not just. Let me fix that typo. It's all good, family. It's all love here. Stone packs and music and life. We're about to love. Um, I'm thinking about doing a documentary and that do and, and watch as soon as I say this, watch if I don't put this documentary out first, watch we look up. And y'all remember I'm saying this. So I don't ever I don't want anybody here to forget it. If I don't do it, watch somebody steal this concept. Because I'm spitting it out into the universe and I'm physically spitting it out. A day without music. And what it would do. You remember they did that documentary like they did like this, imagine, this imaginary documentary of if Latinos were to leave America and what would happen, right? But imagine if music, if you got in your car tomorrow, turn on the radio, and it was just white noise, nothing, right? You got on iTunes, nothing, right? No, no music. Go to work, no music. You turn on your radio, no music because you don't have it on your phone. Just know everywhere you go. Can you imagine the level of chaos? Absolutely, Brother Keith. Brother Cortez, man, would it not? See, and this is why we got to understand the importance of what music plays in life. And we can't downplay it. We have to, we have to take this music stuff serious, man, because it plays such a vital part in life, but everybody downplays it, especially our people. We downplay it, you know, we hate on each other when it comes to supporting each other. But even every community I feel is not just black folks. I feel every, when it comes to downplaying music, I feel every culture actually downplays music and don't really realize the importance of it. Because if they did, we'd have more people supporting everybody because you would see the importance of creators. But let's press that button. Let's just imagine. Let's go into the future and press that button and boom, no music. Bro, I just, I, I wouldn't even want to see, I, I, I can just only imagine how crazy it would be. Brother Key said, yeah, it would cause major problems in life. Rick Meach said, Tra tragedy, music calms the savage beast. <laughs> Brother Gary said, 
No commercials without, yeah, that you can't even sell a commercial without the music. So what, what's my point in all this? Everybody that would hit me on this podcast, let's say you hit me and say, Brother Stone, I got a new record out. Listen, I don't even have to know you. I'm going to download your record today. I'm going to stream it. I'm going to tell other people about it because that's just my character, because I understand the importance of music. I don't have to even like your music. I might not even listen to the stuff you're talking about because I might say, hey, man, listen, I don't support that kind of stuff and what you're talking about, but I support you as a man who's trying to work hard and do the proper thing, so I'm going to go buy this record in hopes and efforts in the future that lyrically you can talk about something that I can really listen to, but I'm going to go support you even if I don't listen to it I will go buy it because that is my status and how I operate. Cambodian mystique. Music is life. Absolutely. Brother Cortez. Music apocalypse. Man, listen, I'm thinking about doing that documentary and I'm serious, man. Like I am really, really thinking about putting that together. Maybe I'll just put a small one together for YouTube maybe not even put it out, but I'm thinking about maybe I wanted to actually do it and put it out, put it out um, on a on a national level. You know what I'm saying? On this huge level where it's it's out worldwide and it's distributed worldwide. Um, but man, I mean, if we just if we just give a little bit of support and we insert in these younger artists how important it is to be responsible for the things they're writing and that it's, it will cause a vibration frequency-wise that can cause people on life in each other. Look at this history. Look at all these rappers in Atlanta and all over the place, and you see some, this person on life, this person on life, this person on life. And every week, a uh, new rapper in Cincinnati, on life, new rapper in such and such, Alaska, on life. And these are no-name rappers, by the way. But now it's a new thing. You'll find out about this rapper you never heard of, and little poopy, right? And he lives in this town you never heard of, but as soon as he dies, somebody, some bloggers online talking about him. Uh, Brother Gary said, an ancient Egypt uh, commit, uh, uh, you could be a high priest without the mastery of music. Yes, okay. In ancient Egypt, he says, you could be a high priest without the mastery of music, which is interesting because I was talking to this guy who, he was, we was talking about the history of Kometz and, and also we were talking about the history of, um, I can't remember what it was. We were talking about these frequency things that the Kemet people would use. They were these, it was kind of like a, the things we use in tuning uh, guitars and it's shaped like this and it's this frequency thing. And they were talking about this instrument they used to use back then. Like they used to hit it and when they hit it, it would do alter certain frequencies in people. And, and it's crazy you would say that. Um, this conversation was definitely meant for us to have today. Hey, Major Keys, what's happening, family? Um, Brother Gary, we're going to have to elaborate more on that because I'm trying to remember exactly what the guy was telling me. So, Brother Gary, uh, Brother Cortez said, yep, rappers where I live that aren't famous are unliving themselves. Oh, my goodness, so much to be to the point where it, uh, it went viral. Three, Where do you live at? Uh Three were unlive in the gas stations that made. I think I might have heard about this, you, but I can't remember the town. Uh, three were unlive in the gas stations that made a diss video. Oh, you got to live in, uh, bro, where you at, Memphis? Brother C Cortez said again, and even wilder at the candlelight at the gas station, days later, their family members were unlive. Damn, all this because of the influences of music. I predict this was when I was 14. Are you in Memphis? Cause that sounds like either a south th a south thing. Well, it happens everywhere, Detroit, Memphis. But that sounds like some some Memphis thing. Memphis, okay, similar to Memphis and Birmingham. Where you look? Where are you located, brother? Um, brother Cortez, where you at? Brother Gary said yes. Hey, cuz Sisterm. Or tools, Egypt with music. Now, you know we, Alabama, see what I say to South, right? Brother Cortez, Brother Gary, we use those in band too. But it's funny because that particular instrument was, was used to tune instruments. And it was real big too. It's, they still use it in school, real big. And it's got like two claws sticking out with one little 
hand to it like this. Something like, and something like, like, hold on. <laughs> I'm trying to do this. Hold on. Something like that, it would look like, like that. That's the way the tool looked, like that. Kind of crazy, man. Um. Okay, Al yeah, Alabama, yeah, man. Listen, Mississippi, Alabama, I don't know. It seemed like all the southern states, but then there's some Midwest states like Ohio and Detroit that be turned super turned up too, man. And Cass is just, I don't know, man. It's I, At this point, we're in, living in an epidemic, a music epidemic when it comes to unlifing. And I'm not happy with it. I will say this. I'm happy I'm an R&B singer. And I don't have to do, I would hate to be a rapper right now. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. Blessings to all the guys that are rapping. Um, I just know that now it's not even about now. It's 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 kind of like the, the street game back in the 80s when cats was out on, you know, serving and doing their thing. Rap has become like that, right? Okay. But then if you think about it, let's go back to what I was saying before. Brother Cortez said, I couldn't talk to most of my peers about the power of it because they thought I was exaggerating. They, uh, br Brother Cortez, two things. They thought you were exaggerating or you're crazy. When you start talking on this frequency that people are not used to hearing you speak on, normal people, I tell people, even this is the reason I tell people, be careful when your pineal gland opens up because when it opens up and you start sharing these deep things with people, um, then people think you're crazy, right? They, they think something's wrong with you. And they want to, ah, oh, dude's kind of, I ain't not all the way there, but really it's a higher, you're vibrating at a higher frequency and you're sharing this important information, but no one wants to listen because they're scared and they want to label you cuckoo. Um, man, listen, the responsibility of the African-American community goes so far. I try to stay away from politics, so I'm not going to make this conversation about anything pol political going on right now because I'm not trying to share none of it, my energy with what's happening in the world right now with that. But I will say this. If we can start at the ground label, level, excuse me, because these days you can't even really speak to young people unless they want to be spoken to. So how do we speak to them without speaking to them? through the music. As an OG, all my OGs is on this live. As an OG, the way we can speak to them without speaking to them is through example, through the way we create music lyrically, melodically, creates open conversations for us then to have a conversation with that young person that we feel like we can change their mental movement and how they're projecting music that can hurt a community, right? Brother CJ, the maestro, shout out Indianapolis in the house, y'all. Indianapolis in the house. Man, I haven't been in. You know what? I'm supposed to go to Indianapolis. I got a friend that lives there has been trying to get me to come. But then every minute I look up, I'm getting a call saying, oh, man, this person got shot in, down my street. Or I was driving down the street and that person got killed. I'm like, oh, hell no. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to go to Indian, Indianapolis. But, um. I, uh, yeah, I was supposed to come there and visit, but I'm like, uh, every time I get told somebody to die, I'm like, shucks, maybe that's a sign for me not to come, you know, somebody done got unlifed again. <laughs> oh, man, Cortez Smith said, oh, yeah, I heard about how, in man, yo, bro, Indiana off the, <laughs> Indiana, they <laughs> I got the Indiana app on my phone, and I swear every time there's something new popping up, every minute in Indiana. And I'm like, yo, bro, this is crazy. But, um, <laughs> hey, y'all, hey, why don't y'all hit that like, man? I ain't seen nobody hit like on here, though. What's up? What's up with the likes? Either, either, if you're hitting it, I don't see it. I don't, and it's weird that I wouldn't see the likes. I think that maybe, I don't know if it, it seemed like it would post while I'm talking and not after. Um, it's crazy, man. Well, I'm not seeing any likes. Uh, front row, Brother Sean said, hey, Stone, CJ is my brother. In oh, is he? Yo, bro, that's crazy. Wait a minute. How CJ, how you, CJ on my YouTube channel and you're on my YouTube. Did you tell CJ about it? Oh, okay, so maybe it hasn't updated on my end. Okay, 
Thank you, Brother Cortez. It probably hasn't updated on, on my end yet. And last night I had like 99 people. I was like, damn, maybe I need to log in at that time. But I'm going to keep doing this because I don't get a chance to do live and everybody suggested that I go live. And, and I, I like to live. Somebody told me um, people like the interaction one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm a talker, man, y'all. Listen, if, if y'all was right here in my studio, we we talk the rest of the day. We I can talk for hours, man. Sometimes it could be a good thing. Sometimes it could be a bad thing. Um, depends on the person's ear. <laughs> but um, how? So hold on, Sean. How did? Okay, so how did I become? You must have shared. My, okay, I'm confused. So brother CJ. Did you follow me on Facebook, on YouTube first? Subscribe to me, or did Sean send it to you? Or, or, okay, I'm confused. What a coincidence. But that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, wow. So, look, we got family on here, man. It's good to see family doubling up on us. Sean, I'm going to have to bring you live one day, man, because we always have great conversations about artists and music and stuff. So one day you're going to have to go live with me, and we're going to have to do this live thing together. So, um. Miss Toy, what's happening? Hey, Stone, finally caught it. Listen, Miss Toy, listen, yesterday I went on and I was doing the music and stuff. And, yeah, I think I had, like, I don't know. Yesterday I went on and I had a whole bunch of comments. I don't know. I'm still learning this live crap. And I don't know if I deleted all the comments. But I had 99 people that had tuned in yesterday, which was cool, because I think I caught everybody at a time where they were available. So, Miss Toy, it's it's good to, to have you here. Welcome. Well, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm talking about, um, you know, R&B music and why us as African-Americans are not really supporting the music that is the fundamental background to our lives and our community and our forefathers and our parents. And and uh, talk about how music, uh, jazz and rock and all that was created by African-Americans and why black people have gotten out of supporting their music because we think it's expendable and we can sit and create music again because we're we're always creating a new style of music. So we figure, shit, we don't care about R&B. We just go create something new. Right. Uh, Brother Sean said, when I get I get the podcast going, CJ, CJ is going to be doing my intro. OK, CJ, you didn't tell me you do intros, man. Miss Toy, yeah, we got the, you got the whole family here, man. Come on, man. It's a family affair. Family affair. Yeah. Okay, um, oh, okay, when you first got your first, in hey, Brother CJ, listen, how weird is, so you follow me a long years ago, I think. What's up, Premium? Hey, now, this, this, this brother right here is a really good brother, really good friend of mine, too, uh, Premium uh, 718 incredible rapper from new york city not only that he's a he's a, a a very very intelligent guy man invest in the stock market if you know any want to know anything about the stock market and what moves not to make to make he's that guy but at the same time he's a extremely talented guy and hopefully him and i can get in the studio and end up finishing an album that's long overdue that we supposed to finish if i can get him in vegas and we can get that done and two or three days it's gonna be a pleasure you guys to hear him he's already got some stuff out so clock in with him so cj you so you followed me on youtube a long time ago yeah no nah, cj is dope you know what i'm saying wow that's crazy small world man but so i'm talking about r&b and the responsibility of the African-American community to support the music that became the soundtrack to our community and and how that music has been taken by other cultures and then how we complain about why our music is being taken, why are these people doing hip hop over here, why Latinas doing hip hop, why white folks doing, why white people taking R&B. But the truth is, is black people don't, we, we ain't supporting our community. We're not supporting each other. So this is what happens when you don't support your community. The music is taken and it, it, it will continue to happen. And, and then we go and create a new style of R&B, hip hop R&B. What's after hip hop R&B? What is it going to be called? Trap r I mean, it's already trap R&B. Well, what are they going to call it next? I mean, you know, you already got pop R&B. You got hip hop R&B, trap R&B. What's next? Because... Us as African-Americans, 
As soon as something gets taken, we go, oh, man, we just going to create a new style, man. You know what I'm saying? We just going to call it, you know, rap in the bag. You know what I'm saying? Now we got rap in the bag because we don't respect our culture and the connection that our music has to our community. Once again, Latinas are never going to walk away from their music. Traditional Africans from Africa will never walk away from their music. You can go into an African club. They might play a few American joints, but they're going to play their traditional music from their culture. You can go in white folks' community. They're going to play the rock music they love at their barbecues. They, and they might throw in a cool in the gang and maybe earth, wind, and fire. But the little kids might be over there in the corner on their phone. But the elders, they ain't really playing. They might toss, might get a Will Smith in. Might. But they're going to support the music they feel like. And if you think about it, um, you know, most white folks is not even from America. So what music is of their culture? I mean, we can talk about Irish and we can talk about some other races and stuff. What's really the music of their culture? They adopted rock that black people created, and they named that as the music of their culture. But the thing is, they've never betrayed it. Now they've adopted blues and jazz. Uh, jazz is now dominated by mostly white artists. If you don't believe me, go look it up. Go look at the jazz concerts. You, if you see a black person in the concert, call me back. And I'll correct myself, but I've watched them. I've been on the tours. I know. Just like what I just told you when I put on that funk festival, I was the vice president of that entertainment company. And I looked in that audience and, and I have the video footage to show you. There was no black people. And it bothered me. Be it bothered me, but it made me happy because I knew that the older musicians that are in their 60s and 70s would not be able to live. The black musicians in their 60s and 70s and 80s would not be able to make a living if they had to count on black folks coming out to shows. It was the Latinas that are holding down old school music right now. Go to any old school concert, the old, like the 60s and 70s and 50s stuff. Latinas is holding it down by far. Now, in some states, you'll see more mix where you'll see some more black people mixed in, but predominantly on the West Coast, Latinas are holding it down. Texas, Latinas are holding it down. Now, are we break into the 80s and 90s. Now, those shows, you'll see more black people. Like, you know, you start seeing the Jodeci's and the Boys to Men and BBD. You'll see more black people at those shows. But if we want to go to the 50s and 60s, 70s artists, man, you ain't going to see no black folks. Them Latinas be holding it down. Thank God for them supporting the community. But what happened to us not supporting our community? How all this shit happened? Uh, brother brother uh, Cortez said, uh, exactly. No other cultures walk away from their music. He says, um, if you uh, see a black person in the concert, they're likely older. Absolutely. Brother Gary said, white people love Charlie Pride. You funny. <laughs> they do love Charlie Pride. Hey, but you got a whole list of new black country artists now. The young dude, like they got this one young dude who's crazy but yeah white folks swore on charlie pride that's why it pissed me off that they had such a problem with beyonce and they gave her they said all these crazy racist things about beyonce i was really upset about that like like i was bothered but it showed you that racism in music is real but the music country music was created by us but but so now you're saying beyonce can't do country music it, it, it's, it's it's nuts man it's just truly nuts uh, Brother Sean said, Mike Epps had a uh, free concert here in Indianapolis today with Allure. I can't see the other name. Uh, this damn little thing on the side. Uh, Forrest and D's, and then my cousin was on that show. It was a nice crowd also. Sean, you should have told me. I would have told you to reach out to my cousin, man, while you were there at the show. I'll hit you up about that, but my cousin was on that show. So I would have told you to um, to uh, holla, hit, hit, you know, I probably could have got you, and you probably was already in free anyway. Listen, what are we going to do, you guys? Our responsibility, what are we going to do? And how are we going to do it? And when are we going to do it? That's the question I'm asking everybody on this live. Each and every one of us hold a responsibility. Not just the musicians, but influencers like Sean, Big Meech, and other people on this live. We all have a responsibility. And if we all put a little bit of element in there, we can actually make a difference even if it's not in this lifetime, eventually it'll have a butterfly effect down the road and the things that we want to change will slowly begin to happen. Even if it's just the attention we need to give to younger artists and implement that knowledge of about 
being responsible with the things that you're writing. Oh, Sonya in the house. OG Sonya. That's a supporter. I, I'm here's my New Jersey accent, you guys. My New York, New Jersey accents. Uh, that's supporter. The supporter, Sonja Commenter. Uh, what's up, Sonja? The supporters in the house. Sure, supporter. What's up, supporter? She's probably over there cracking up. Uh, welcome, Sonja, to the uh, the live. We just sitting here by me. She was actually one of the persons that also said that I should go live more, and I appreciate that, Sonja. <laughs> She's laughing. I agree. It's a supporter. The supporter. Sh- sure, it's a supporter. But um, <laughs> hey, you guys, I'm silly too, man. You get to know me. I'm a funny dude. But um, I love laughing. Um, our responsibility, you guys. We got to support the R&B artists. I'm not just saying that because I'm an R&B artist. I'm a funk artist. I'm saying that because what's our future going to be? If, if we don't support R&B, and this is why I love Tyrese Passion and the things that he says. He means what he says, and he says what he means. He is standing up for R&B. He believes in it. And I am with Tyrese on this campaign, and this is why I put so much love and effort in my records. Um. I think that if we support the people that are saying and doing the right things and that are trying to make a difference. Now, once again, you notice I said earlier, I still support people even when they're, it's music I don't like. And what do I mean by that? Derogatory music, if they're talking about stuff that I probably would never, ever listen to, I still buy their record because I'm going to support another black man because I want to see, I want to help people because I want, I want somebody to do that for me. So I'm going to support them as well right so you got to in order to get support you got to give it the universe only knows what you do it, it's not biased so if you support people support beget support right whether you like it or not brother gary said uh let me start with brother uh cj maestro i appreciate what you do with with your channel i've learned so much from you your tutorials and music knowledge thank you brother cj maestro brother i appreciate you i appreciate you even subscribing to my channel I appreciate each and every one of you guys, man. And I know that, um, you know, people sometimes say that very casually, but 100 percent. If I if I saw you, brother, I I would sit down and buy you dinner and to show my appreciation, because I understand that that uh, no channel or no artist. They're nothing without the support of people believing in everything they're doing. So I appreciate you guys taking out the five minutes, 10, 30, 20 minutes of your time to even hear me say whatever I got to say. I appreciate you, man, and for tuning in again and again. The love is real, man, and I and I will never default on you guys. Brother Gary said, when I was in uh, when I was a student in Government Associated uh, Association uh, at uh, is that Tuskegee, yeah, in Tuskegee we brought down the um, of George Clinton, my uncle George for homecoming and white kids for album uh, white kids for Al- Auburn University uh, sold out concert. Listen, sorry about the babble. Uh, but my gla- these glasses, I have to put my other ones on. To- Sometimes I got to squint. But all of George's shows, by the way, are mostly white folks. Now, let me tell y'all something deep. Miss Toy, 100. You're live. Talk about deep topics. Thank you, Mystique. Oh, man. Thank you, Brother CJ. S- support Stone Paxson on all. This, uh, his music is jamming. Thank- oh, you listen to the music? Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Um, let me tell you about funk. I released my In the Key of Love album December of 2019. Now, check this out. December of 2019. That album charted number one on the UK soul charts. And it stayed in the charts, and I kid you not, from 2019 until 20 almost 2021 now that album was an experimental album if you go listen to that album in the key of love stone paxson in the key of love funk i was in a funk band the rick james stone city band so i want i said how can i mix my funk stuff with my r&b stuff with a little bit of neo soul neo soul so i experimented on that album and i mixed a little bit of everything on that record and man let me tell you something man i was so surprised how well that album did. Now, the crazier part about music is from 2019 to December to almost 2021, that record stayed on the UK charts in, in Amsterdam and Spain and Brazil, right? 
it 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 didn't even hit the charts in the U at U S at that time. That's the craziest part about it. And then we pressed vinyl up. So then the vinyl sold out in Japan, and and I got some vinyl. So anybody looking for vinyl, uh, and you want to buy exclusive stone packs and vinyl, I got vinyl here too. I, I'll we'll talk about that next time. But let's see. Um, it charted, and then it started to kind of taper off the charts at the maybe end of 2021 early 2021 end of 2021 middle and then just recently about three months ago that in the key of love album broke into the usa top 100 r&b albums at number 84 go figure right i mean it blew, it kind of blew my mind because when i looked up and i'm like dang that record is so it shows you that music when you create great music especially funk music. You know, you got, I mean, all my supporters of my, my music, the funk stuff, are Latinas and white people. And I'm going to show you something crazy. It, this one's going to blow your mind. So when I released my funk album in the U.K., in the U.K., you got, you got a breakup of DJs. You got the white DJs. So if, if you don't know anything about the U.K., I'm about to educate you guys a little bit. You got the white DJs and the black DJs. Now, what the white DJs play the black DJs will not play, especially if it's not straight R&B, soul, or neo So The black DJs in the UK will not play funk stuff. Like, they don't play none of my funk stuff. This is The whole dynamic is crazy. But the white DJs, white radio stations, which, by the way, all the white folks in the UK, the radio stations are ran by predominantly powerhouse Caucasians, right? They, they control it. All of my funk records are played. Like I can look up radio. I can look at my radio numbers right now, and I promise you, probably today, I probably had maybe. I kid you not. Maybe fifteen stations, maybe seven or eight stations are playing my old records currently. I'm, we're gonna look right now. Let's look real quick. Just to sh just to give you an idea of what I'm saying. Okay. But now, here it is right here. Hold on. Uh, hold on. I think I spelled it wrong. Spelled my own name wrong. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry, you guys. Just give me one second. Okay. I just want to give you an idea of what I'm saying. Okay. Here we go. Stone Paxton top songs on radio. Right. Hold on. Who was that? Uh, Jim Brown. What's up, brother Jim? Uh, Jim Brown says we have to all get humbled again. Too much sensationalism and money driving results. Absolutely. Brother Jim, listen, thank you for chiming in, man. That is that's so beautifully said. Um, we have to, you know, and this is why I operate in my element of being humble, because. It doesn't matter who I've worked with or who I've been a part of. It doesn't make me any better than anybody on my life. What it does is just says I have a little bit of history in what I do, but it doesn't make me any better. And I like what Brother Jim said because he said we have to all get humbled again. Too much sensationalism and money driving results. Absolutely, man. Like this whole element of being grounded is real. If you stay grounded, you don't have to worry about an ego. You don't have to worry about feeling like you need to be humble because you stay in that space of humbleness. You don't let money drive you. You don't let money influence your thoughts or the way that you treat people, right? Uh, the Beat Buffet said, I just seen a great interview with Boosie Collins, and he was saying, we got to teach the kids about the funk and what it meant, like the history of it to keep our music alive. Ah, man, come on, man. Listen, Boosie is so right. He's never been wrong. I talk to Bootsy probably every other month. I'll have a conversation with him. Listen, this phone is kind of broken up. But listen, just today, there's six stations in five different countries playing seven different tracks of mine right now. No joke. Now, when I show you this screen, it's, it's kind of cracked. But I'll show you. I don't know if you can see that. It says. I don't know if you guys can see it. Hold on, let me bring this light up. Now, hold on, let me get it right. Can you guys see that? Maybe the light is hold it off. Let me turn it a little bit. Okay, that should show you better. See, there's six stations. How many different countries, right? 
playing my stuff, right? Okay. Now, these are all the songs of mine that are still playing. Show it to you again. And sorry about the broken phone. This phone I don't use. Uh, this is just my little broken phone. Now, those are all my songs that are still playing right there. Currently. Those are all my records that they're currently playing worldwide. Now, there's days where, there's days I might have um, 30 stations playing my records, right? There might be days I might have 100 stations playing my record. Right now, I don't have a new album out. So the fact that I don't have a new album out, I'm not, because it costs money to get songs on radio. So the fact of me not having a new album out, and I got currently, as I'm sitting here talking to you guys, there's stations playing my records across the country. It's beautiful. But what it tells me is that the time that I put into creating my records, I did a great job. I did a great job at creating the records. I also did a great job at writing, lyrically, arrangements, and all that, enough for these DJs to say, I want to play it. So in the UK, when I do an album, I know that my funk songs are going to be played by the white DJs. And then when I get ready to promote my R&B stuff, I only send my R&B stuff to the black DJs, like the R&B. So I send it to the white DJs, too, because they'll play both. But the black DJs, for some reason... In the UK, they don't really care about funk. I, I don't know why, I you know, but they ain't really into it. They're into the neo soul and the R&B. They don't care, the black DJs. And it's really that dynamic in the UK. I kid you not. I deal with it on a regular basis. Uh, Big Me says, um, <laughs> bro, don't waste your time. We can't see Jack. Oh, no. Yeah, you could. Because when I, when I posted it back again, I looked at it on my screen. So I saw it. When I, when I angled it, Big Me, I was able to see it. No, trust me. Go back and look at it again. When I angled it, I could see it. So if I could see it on my screen, this screen here, then definitely you, you can see it. So just look at it again. You'll see I angled it, and you can see it, okay? Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, listen. We have to get back to the responsibilities in the African-American community, supporting each other. Musicians, when you have an opportunity, you're working with those artists in the studio and you can influence them and some of the stuff you hear them writing. Be that influence. Sl slide that advice in there, because if they're in your studio, they're listening to you. If they're in your studio, if they're in your studio, they're listening to you, which means you have more of an influence for them to be able to listen to you. OK, um, Stone packs and music and life, you guys. I'm gonna log off. And only reason I'm logging off because it looks like my battery is about to go dead. So I'm out. Catch me on the next live, you guys. Peace and love. I appreciate you, man. Let's go.